Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on Season 6, Episode 17, Wrongs Darker Than Death or Night. This episode aired April 1st, April Fool's, 1998. Wow, that's such a great episode title. (laughs) It's a title. Before we (laughs) talk about this episode, anything to say about last week's episode, Change of Heart? I thought it was perfect. I liked it. We actually didn't record last week, so it was two weeks ago, so I had to think, which one was that? That was the Dax and Worf episode, right? Yes. Solid episode. It really was. It was all Worf's fault. Oh, yes. Everything Couldn't control fault. his wife. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> That's a joke. I don't think that was the takeaway from it. <laughs> it's a joke. All right. Are we ready to start talking about this episode? Absolutely. Well, we start in Quark's. And Dax is trying to convince Worf that they should have a party. Worf, of course, doesn't like parties of any kind. Mr. Frown. Yeah, Dax would probably have a party every day if she could. So it's, you know, pretty much goes as expected. Yep. After Worf heads out to exercise, Quark turns up with some Bajoran lilacs for Major Kira. Jadzia is being her nosy self and asks if there's something going on between Kira and Quark. And Kira (laughs) says, don't be disgusting. Oh, Dax is so wonderfully nosy. Eventually, Kira does relent and says it's her mother's birthday and lilacs were her favorite. Kira was only three years old when her mother died, so she doesn't really have any memories of her. She does tell Dax that her father called her the bravest woman he'd ever met. I like the idea of Dax's party. Come dressed as your favorite Klingon. I think Wolf was being (laughs) a stick in the mud there. I mean, she should have picked anything but Klingon. And I think he would have been okay. Well, she's young. Partying's kind of fun at that age. You don't need five days to recover from it. Yeah, right. Now in Kira's quarters, she's asleep and in full makeup, of course, and hair, with her earrings still on. (laughs) (laughs) When she gets an incoming call that the computer can't identify, so caller ID's broken, turns out to be a FaceTime from Gold Ducat. Definitely not something you want to see first thing in the morning. No, or the middle of the night. Or any time of day. He claims he wants to help her the same way Captain Sisko helped him. I mean, please hang up at this point. Why? Uh, That's enough information. He just wants to share with her the clarity that Sisko gave him to see beyond the lies Mm. and the self-deception. Yeah. Do you think Wayun, Kira, and Damar are standing behind Ducat as he's doing this? Yeah, don't you? That's what I was picturing, that they were all there and like Damar was egging him on. And the Kira will be saying, she won't take your call. (laughs) Yeah, right. She's laughing at you. Well, Ducat says Sisko helped him uncover the truth about his own life. So I guess he enjoyed his time in the episode Waltz, from what we can tell here. (laughs) You know, where he tortured and beat Sisko and kept seeing hallucinations. That was a load of fun for him. Yeah, I think it's good for Ducat. Yeah. So Ducat says, I'm going to do the same for you. And what better day than on your mother's birthday? Ugh. He gives a bunch of details about her mother, which definitely gets Kira's attention. But she says there's no way for him to have known her mother. And Ducat says she didn't die in a refugee camp. He claims that her father lied to her because he couldn't face the truth. And the truth is she left Kira's father to be with Ducat. He says they were lovers until the day she died. When Kira laughs, Ducat says her mother loved Bajoran lilacs. And then he wraps up this grim call by saying, I told you the truth was liberating, Major. Now, don't you feel better? I do. And then he hangs up, leaving Kira in shock. Yes. And we cue the theme song. I think Kira just needs to have call blocking enabled. Yes. Anytime it's unregistered number. Don't answer it. Yeah. I never answer it if I don't know who it is. And that's in 2023. <laughs> you don't answer the phone when I call you. It's true. I don't answer the phone when I do know who it is either. So basically, I don't <laughs> answer the phone. <laughs> I'm an introvert. <laughs> you gotta text me. Has your texting broken? <laughs> I don't understand why she would listen to him. I mean, okay, she knows it's her mother's birthday and there's lilacs behind her. It was a pretty safe bet that she got those lilacs for her mother's birthday. So it's not like that's some giant revelation. Well, after the theme song, we see Kira digging through files about the occupation and she looks up her mother, Kira Maru. We can't see what's in the text on the screen, but she does have sort of a funny look on her face as she scrolls through the text. It does look like she's confused about what she's reading. Yeah. And then we jump to Ops, where Miles is chatting with Julian about a Holosuite program set at the Alamo. 
Carrie comes in and is immediately irritated by this pointless conversation happening near her workspace. Eventually, she interrupts them to tell Miles to get to work, and she asks why Bashir is there. When he starts sort of babbling, she says, you know, we're working here. In other words, get out, Julian. (laughs) Uh, Yes, Wolf likes doing that as well. Yes. Please leave the bridge. Well, he leaves, and now she sees that everyone in ops is staring at her, so she tells everyone to get back to work. <laughs> yes, the way they all sort of stop and are all looking at her like, uh... Well, she she wasn't impolite. I mean, come on, people. Why are you all standing around? <laughs> and what is Julian doing there? He's just coming to gossip. It's the most pointless conversation. Get to work. Well, you can say that a lot of the time about Julian. Well, what exactly are you doing? Why are you here? Continuing her prickly mood, Major Kira goes to see Odo about increased criminal activity on the promenade. Odo is pretty agreeable with her, but does say Dr. Bashir told him she seemed irritable. And so, as you would expect, this irritates her even more. And he asks her what's wrong, and she does soften a bit, but she says talking about it isn't going to help. So Odo says, well, if you can't talk about it, maybe you should consider doing something about it instead. I really liked Odo here. Yeah, He, like, doesn't push the issue. Nope is very sort of conciliatory towards mm-hmm. her. Seems understanding. He's not nosy. Yeah, and gives her some good advice. Season one Odo. Yeah, he wouldn't have reacted well to this. <laughs> yeah. Season six Odo seems much more balanced. And it's like, oh, something's on her mind. Can I try to help? She doesn't want the help. I'll just give her some free advice. Kind of thing you would do, Kim. Yeah. Although I sympathize with Kira. What's more irritating when you're already cranky when somebody tells you you're crabby? It's like, uh, duh. (laughs) I don't like it when people assign my mood to me. I already know what kind of a mood I'm in. (laughs) And also here, Julian clearly ran right to Odo and said that Kira was being mean to him because she didn't want him in ops for absolutely no reason. Oh, Julian's a huge (laughs) gossip. I would imagine he only rivals Dax for knowing what's going on on the station. Yeah, but Dax would never have run to Odo to complain that Kira was being mean to her. Mm, I don't know. I argue this is the exact reason that Julian shouldn't be in ops. Uh, he doesn't even know how to be a professional. Uh, well, yes. Well, now we go to Cisco's office with Kira, and Cisco is surprised that Ducat contacted her and she didn't report it. But she says it was a personal matter. Yeah, but still, he is a wanted criminal. Cisco does point out that Ducat is quite resourceful, so maybe could find things out about her mother, which is very true about Ducat. Yeah. He is very good at getting information. So there is a valid part of it of, are you sure the files you looked at were correct? Yeah. Are you sure Ducat didn't do a lot of research or bribe exactly. someone to get information or modify the computer? Yeah, Cisco knows. Cisco is quite correct mm-hmm. here. He knows what Ducat is like. The problem is Ducat also is good at pressing the buttons and would yeah. do that deliberately to, mm-hmm. to her, to Cisco, to anyone. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I always just look at Damar held this guy in absolute awe. and. Ducat was just petty and mean to him because he could be. Yeah. And that's with someone who is his closest ally. Yeah. Yeah. Cisco is giving her some wisdom. Right. But does she listen to him? Not really. <laughs> she, <laughs> she says she needs to consult the orb of time on Bajor and she needs his help as emissary. Cisco is very concerned about her interfering with the timeline, but she says the prophets will be guiding her. And she asks, please, Emissary, let me seek the will of the prophets. Now, Nana Visitor really made you feel this scene. The way she so uncharacteristically pleads to Cisco as the Emissary, it felt so heartfelt. This was something deeply emotional to her. And I thought it worked in this scene. I didn't feel like it was a jump out of what you would expect for Kira. You know, like how sometimes it can write a character doing something that's so out of what you would expect. No, I didn't think it was out of character for Kira, but I do question that this is a valid reason to agree to let her time travel. Well, it's one thing that if you're consulting an orb that's going to give you visions and answer your questions, but this is apparently going to allow her to go back in time like they did in Trials and Tribulations. So she could, even though it's not a Starfleet sanctioned trip, she still could completely change the timeline. And I don't understand why Cisco would be okay with that. He is the emissary. He trusts in the prophets. Apparently. (laughs) Seems crazy to me. Well, it seems crazy that somebody who's a known liar could cause her to go back in time and that Cisco would allow it or agree to it, knowing that 
she could go back in time. And she has said if she sees Dukat, she's going to kill him. So she could go back and kill him and that would change everything. Yeah. And she tries, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I would say there are maybe three people on the station I would truly trust to go back in time and not mess with the timeline. Mm -hmm. Kira would probably be the number one. Wolf and then Cisco. Hmm. Well, and I think you'd be sadly disappointed because Kira was all ready to start killing people. <laughs> well, obviously it changes at the end of this episode. but And really, I think what we've seen on this show is that all of them would. I think they would all change something because yeah. they're all pretty emotional. Hmm. Interesting. Maybe not deliberately change it, just accidentally happen to change it. <laughs> well, remember, even Cisco went to see Kirk at the end of Trials and Tribulations. So even he is not completely free from interference. Oh, that's yeah. right. He wanted to get Kirk's signature so he could eBay it. Right. Or sell it on the dark web. Well, now we go to Bajor and a Vedic taking Kira to the Orb of Time, or as I like to call it, a migraine trigger. <laughs> she immediately finds herself in a cave filled with Bajorans and a man enters saying, Maru, I found Nerys. And Kira is shocked as she realizes these are her parents. It is completely creepy how these things, the orbs, know exactly what a person wants to see and where they want to go. It's totally creepy. It's the will of the prophets. I guess so. A couple of other men try to take the children's food, and adult Kira steps in and fights them off, taking their weapon. Don't mess with Kira. Her parents then introduce themselves to Major Kira, and when she meets the child version of herself, she doesn't want to say her name is Nerys, obviously, because that's the kid's <laughs> name. So instead, yeah. she says it's Luma Rall. Now, if she introduces herself as Luma Rall, shouldn't her name be Rall and not Luma? Um... Because... Kira Nerys is her name, yeah. but in her culture, Nerys is really her first name. Right. So here she says she's Luma Rall, but they call her Luma. Huh. I feel like they screwed that up. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, I could be wrong. We take information from someone who knows better, but it seemed like they did it backwards. Yeah. A Bajora now enters with four armed Cardassians, saying the new orbital station is nearing completion and the men stationed there require, double quotes, comfort women, close quotes. So he starts randomly picking women from around the cave, saying their families will be given additional rations of food and medicine, courtesy of the prefect, Gold Ducat. Naturally, this jerk picks both Maru and Nerys. And several other women with children. Yeah. Maru shouts to her husband to not let the children forget her as the women are dragged away. It's, it's horrible. Okay, now... I think this might be based on the historical thing which happened in the Second World War of the Japanese Empire, having comfort women in imperial occupied Korea. And it's one of those things of, you know how you say, Kim, when you start looking into history, don't look into this one. It just gets worse. No, that's horrible. I'm sure yeah. this happened. It's just awful. And I'm not sure I really wanted it in Star Trek. We now go to an outside shot of Tarek Nor in the past, as you see it orbiting Bajor. Oh, it's all beautifully spiffy inside, too. Uh-huh. It's very clean. Inside, we see the women selected are being given quarters, and Major Kira is rooming with her mother, and this Bajoran thug who's helping the Cardassians, I forget what his name is, but I'm going to call him Mr. Creepy, he tells the women to enjoy the food in their quarters and to be sure and linger in the sonic showers, because the Cardassians value cleanliness. There's some low points in this episode, but I have to say that was the lowest. <laughs> yeah. It's like you've taken these people away from their homes and now you're complaining about their cleanliness. You are horrible. I think the idea is to show the depravity of the Cardassian occupation. I hope Kira looks up Mr. Creepy now and takes him out. Oh, Basso? <sighs> yeah, he was dangling from a lamppost very quickly. Well, Kira tells Maru that there must be a resistance cell on the station and they'll figure out a way to get out. But her mother sees the food in their quarters and is excited to eat fresh food again. She then starts thinking of her husband and children and starts to cry. Kira now sees a scar on the side of her mother's face caused by a Cardassian. This was something that Dukat mentioned that he knew about earlier, but not something I think Kira was aware of. Yeah. And then Maru asks why Kira is helping her and Kira says she doesn't have many friends. Oh. Because I just came from the future and I don't know anyone. That's true. Anyway, now we go back to the super creepy Bajoran dude who has assembled the kidnapped Bajoran women. They're all now elegantly dressed like they are playthings or dolls. And Mr. Creepy says their old lives have ended and their pasts have been erased. He says their one purpose now is to provide comfort and care to the Cardassian officers stationed there. If they fail, their families will be sent to a labor camp. No pressure. He continues to make threats when Ducat enters and tells him to shut up so that he can look like the nice guy. It's so gross. Do you think that was all arranged too? Probably. Oh, yeah. Ducat is 
an even creepier welcome wagon than the Bajoran dude. Oh, yeah. He says he knows they think Cardassians are cruel, and he intends to change their views. He hopes in time they'll come to appreciate the better part of their nature. He says, we are capable of great kindness. Yeah, what you think is kind is actually really just slavery, but that's okay. Is this an example of Ducat's own self-deception? Or is this just his standard manipulative propaganda? It's both. Do you think he believes it? I think it's both, and I think he believes it, yes. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether this is all an act or whether he really means it, that he's convinced himself he is the kind one. He absolutely believes that he is the kind one. Yeah. Because he talks about it in Waltz, right? That he did believe it. Obviously, deep down, we realize he hates all of it. But I think he really does think he is a benevolent leader. Yeah. I think when he sets up those deceptions so that he looks like the good guy, I do think he does that on purpose. But I think he does that because it sort of speeds along proving oh, that he's benevolent. I get you. That's how I see it. Yeah. In fact, I think I have that in my notes later. <laughs> When Maru asks about her family, Mr. Creepy gets in her face, but Ducat brushes him off. And again, you know, so he can look like the good guy. Ducat tells her their families will be well taken care of. And then he touches her hair because he's a disgusting predator. Yes. And he sees the scar that she's hiding. And Mr. Creepy says he didn't see the imperfection and he'll have her removed at once. But instead, Ducat orders him to fetch a dermal regenerator. Ducat is in disgusting full form here, saying her scar is a reminder of the gulf that exists between our people, and it must be removed immediately. And then he uses the regenerator to remove the scar, and he calls her beautiful. This entire time, Major Kira is trying hard not to strangle him, because not only is this horrifying, but it would be quite hard to watch someone do this to your own mother. Yeah, she's close enough, that one good knife blow straight into his throat. Exactly. That would be the end of this. Yeah. Now we have some kind of twisted mixer where the women are forced to pretend like they're happy to be prostituted and demeaned. And as if it wasn't bad enough that the Cardassians took away their homes and their rights, now they take them away from their families and force them into servitude and prostitution. This is just so much fun. I think I will avoid describing this party in too much detail because you can imagine it's just awful. Yes. Well, Maru tells Kira that Bajorans can survive anything, which is probably good. A drunk Cardassian grabs Maru and starts manhandling her, while another tells Kira to sit on his lap and tell him how much she hates Cardassians. I'm not sure which is worse. They're both gross. And then Ducat enters and sees the guy assaulting Maru, pulls the guy off and tells him to get away from her, and he slinks away. Kira is watching this exchange, and Ducat tells Basso, Mr. Creepy, to escort Maru back to her quarters and make sure her privacy is respected. And then the Cardassian with Nari says, I only hope you won't condemn us all for the boorish behavior of one man. And then Ducat says the exact same line, letting Kira know that it's all a big setup. Yes, Kira is shocked that she asks him, how did you know that? Yeah. And he replies, let's say this isn't the first performance I've seen of this little melodrama. Right. He says that Maru has caught the prefect's eye, so she's now off limits to the rest of them. Ducat is such a creepy predator. Well, and I really feel like he's putting on the show because of his desperate need to be worshipped and admired and loved. Yeah. It's just so gross. I think you hit the right word there, worshipped. Yeah. But even then, look what happens when somebody worships him. He treats them like Damar. Right. Well, after the ad break, Kira is walking down a hallway with the same Cardassians she was with earlier, and he's now very drunk. Is this Damar's father? Damar's father could be. A family trait? Was Damar a drunk? Oh, yeah. Yes. He was. I forgot. Did you see here the slit in her dress, how comically high it goes? (laughs) No, I did not. Absolutely ridiculous. It like goes above her hip bone, I think. Oh. Well, anyway, she manages to send the legate on his way and enters her quarters looking for Maru. But she finds instead Mr. Creepy, who tells her that Maru has moved up in the world. Their beloved prefect has invited her to share his quarters. Kira says she wants to see her and starts a fight, punching one of the Cardassians, but somehow totally forgetting of the second one who hits her across the back of the head knocking her out. And then they throw her into the general population area of the station where the other Bajorans are living. Well, more accurately, they throw her stunt double into the general population. And now we're back in the Tarek Nor that we've seen before. It was a lot cleaner and less grim. It didn't have all the smoke. I guess because they haven't started the full ore processing there yet. Yeah. Because it wasn't dark and it wasn't smoky. Yet, exactly. I'm also surprised that they didn't kill her. She just assaulted a Cardassian. Or sent her to one of the labor camps on the planet. Yeah. 
Maybe there's too much paperwork. Oh, you know there'd be a lot of paperwork in the Cardassian system. Yeah. I was also wondering whether they wanted to use her as an on-station warning to the other people. Maybe. Yeah. If you don't go along with this, you'll get thrown into the general pop. Yeah. An example. Right. Now we go to Kira waiting in line for what looks like water soup. There's nothing in that soup. And the guy who was serving the soup joins her at her table, saying that her friend Maru has been off the station for a few weeks, taking a vacation with Ducat. He calls Maru a collaborator, but Kira protests. I find it really frustrating to hear him say these so-called comfort women are collaborators. I mean, they're forced into this situation. I just, I don't understand it. And also, coming from a male perspective where you don't have the same view of the power dynamic, I just find it super insulting. This guy says he's been watching Kira and he knows that she has no love for the Spoonheads. We haven't heard that in a long time. Yeah. Kira tells him she doesn't want to join his resistance cell, but he just wants her to draw a map of the Cardi side of the station. (laughs) Yeah, we're getting all the greats in here. We are. Before she can answer that request, Mr. Creepy turns up and tells Kira to follow him. I thought this was very responsible for Kira because she could have a significant impact on the resistance with her operational knowledge. Plus, she knows the future of the station, its layout, probably the control systems, etc. She could make Mm -hmm. a huge difference to the fight 20-odd years in the past. Yeah. I think this is where she's being responsible. She's not getting involved in an area where she could make a huge difference. Yeah, she holds off for a while. (laughs) Well, yeah. So now we're walking to Ducat's quarters, and right outside of his door, Kira has to walk through some kind of a scanning field looking for weapons. Inside, she sees Maru, and they hug. This is where Maru calls her Luma, and the names seem backwards to me. Anyway, Nerys asks if Ducat has hurt her, and Maru says no. She says she wishes she knew how to make her understand. Just then, Ducat walks in saying she's treated Maru with nothing but kindness and consideration. We learn here that Maru requested Kira to be her companion. And then Ducat kisses Maru goodbye. And you can see Maru is playing along here as her eyes kind of dart around when this happens. Yes. He leaves and Maru says he's very different from what she expected. Kira is annoyed, telling her that while she's in here playing parlor games, Ducat is carrying out the extermination of their people. Ducat even says to Kira there, I'm not the monster you think I am. (laughs) Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. She knows exactly who he is. Yeah, she knows you from the future, dude. She's not far off. Maru says that's not true. He's written to Central Command, begging them to change their policies towards Bajor. When Kira protests, she says, Kira just doesn't know him. (laughs) Kira is pretty angry and says, he took you away from your children. And Maru tells her that he's sending her family food and medical supplies. And Kira doesn't understand how she can forget her husband so quickly. Yeah. When Maru says that she's doing this for her family, Kira says she's just telling herself that she's doing this for her children. She says the clothes, the easy living, it's not for them. It's for you. You like it here. You enjoy playing house with that murderer. Ouch. She calls Maru a collaborator and storms out, saying she's going back where she belongs. Wow. That's season one angry, Kira. Oh, yeah. Nanad is great in this whole scene. Yep. That whole part where... Ducat is in the room at the beginning. Yeah. She's just exuding utter contempt for this person. Yeah. Loved it. Well, Kira is now talking to the soup guy who is holding a Bajoran earring, which is apparently a mini bomb, and it's made of ultridium resin. They don't think the Cardassian sensors will pick it up, but they are completely sure. (laughs) Kira is already back in resistance fighter mode, and she says, let me worry about that. Oh, I think she's crossed the line here. Uh, She's now actively getting involved. Yep. He tells her it has a 20-meter blast radius, and once it's activated, it can't be disarmed. He warns Kira that she can't tell Ducat's Bajoran mistress, and Kira says, like you said, she's a collaborator. She takes the bomb and says she deserves whatever she gets. Ouch. I don't know, Kira. It seems like a bomb might be an example of you changing the timeline. Well, um... Just because you're mad at your mom? Oh my god. What are you doing? I think that's a little extreme, yes. Kira now goes to see Mr. Creepy and says she wants to apologize to Maru, and he eventually agrees to take her in, and she pauses before walking through the weapon scanner this time. But everything seems okay. Tense moment over. In Ducat's quarters, Maru and Ducat are sitting together holding hands and being kind of (laughs) gross. Kira apologizes and says she'd like to be friends again, and this makes Maru happy, and they hug. Mr. Creepy gives Ducat a data rod before being sent off to find Kira some new quarters. And Ducat hands this stick to Maru, saying, This is for you. You'll find it very interesting. 
While Maru is sitting down to see what's on this USB drive, Ducat heads to his study and Kira places the bomb in a nearby potted plant, wasting no time. Oh yeah, she's not messing around. But then when she's about to leave, she sees that on the USB drive is a message from her father and he's telling Maru they're now back home and the children are happy and healthy again. He goes on to say that he's told the children she's still at the refugee center. Yeah, and he says about how Kira is now put on white and is healthy again. Yep. He goes on to say, you've saved all of our lives. I hope you realize that. And now Kira sees her mother is crying. Yep. Her father says, no matter what happens, Maru, I love you and I'll always love you. And her mother touches the screen as the message ends. Yes. And she's crying. It's very much not what Kira expected. No, she has immediate regret and grabs Maru's arm, telling her that we have to get out of here. Then even more shockingly, she turns around and says, Ducat, there's a bomb and hustles him out. Yes, she actually pushes him out the room. Yes, and they all run from the quarters. And just as they get out, there's an explosion and all three of them are thrown to the ground, along with the guards by the door. Ducat and Maru appear to both be unharmed. But when Maru looks back for Nerisse, who is right next to her, she's disappeared. And there is a sort of pinkish purple flash of light and Kira is back in the orb chamber and a very freaked out Kira closes the (laughs) orb. (laughs) Again, some more of that facial acting from Nana Visitor. She is like, yeah, what the hell happened? What just happened? And as it's the prophets, you know, the Vedic who is nearby will be like, you're only in there for like a minute. Yeah. Back to the station and Kira tells Cisco that she's always hated collaborators. She thought it was so simple. Cisco tells her that her mother did what she had to do to save her family, and Nerys replies, it doesn't make it right. Cisco says maybe not, but it was her decision to make. Kira has done more digging and found that her mother died in a Cardassian hospital seven years after she met Dukat, and tells Cisco, do you know how many Bajorans died during that time, while my mother sat sipping canar with Dukat? Cisco asks, if you hated her that much, why did you save her life? And Kira says, there's part of me that wishes I hadn't. But the fact is, no matter what she did, she was still my mother. The end. Wow. That was a fascinating episode. It's a funny nuance for Cisco to say, why did you save her life? When instead, he should have said, why didn't you kill her? Because (laughs) it's not like she saved her life. She just didn't kill her because that's what she was planning to do. That's true. Okay, so let's go into over analysis. What do you have? Do you think Cisco's going to be annoyed? When Kira told her, well, I tried to blow up Ducat and I killed two Cardassian guards exactly. who were standing at the door. There. So I might have kind of changed the timeline. It could have. And if this bomb attack was going to happen anyway, then was probably a Bajoran that was going to do it. Yes. So did that Bajoran in the original timeline get killed? I mean, it's a great question. That's what I had in my notes, too, is that she killed two people. So she could have changed the timeline dramatically. And possibly saved the life of Joran, who was going to carry out the attack. Mm. I was wondering about this and thinking, Ducat had talked before about how there were assassination attempts yep. on his life on the station. Right. I was wondering whether this was one of the ones that happened anyway. So it didn't change the timeline enough. Those guards were already killed. The Bajoran who planted it maybe got away. So it didn't really change anything. You know, I hadn't thought about that. I suppose it's possible that the prophets actually put her in place with somebody who did exist Yeah. for that time period. Oh. And that person maybe was killed. Oh. Yeah. So she was actually inhabiting their body. So she didn't look like Kira. She was someone else. Right. That's perfectly possible with the uh, prophets. They are that kind of tricky. So you've taught me... The value of headcanon. <laughs> well, you can write off so much with the prophets being able to you can. do miraculous things. Well, they're gods. And I think about that a lot. That's a really good one. I like that. Next thing. I believe the orb of time needs to be buried, hidden, forgotten about, because that thing is extraordinarily dangerous. Yeah. If it has the potential for changing the timeline, and we know the prophets have a problem with altering the timeline. Look at the poet who died and then they Mm. basically fixed him and you have all this additional work, Mm -hmm. which would, again, like you say, alter the timeline. And they seem to have no appreciation for the corporeals and how time kind of needs to be linear. So that orb is extraordinarily dangerous. I agree, though now that we've talked about it, maybe it doesn't really allow you to change the timeline. Maybe we're just assuming that. And Maybe that's what other people are thinking, too, but but yeah. maybe it doesn't really. I don't know. Oh, I see what you mean. 
So maybe the prophet let you go back, but it doesn't actually affect the major events that happen. Like in the Tribbles episode, where the Klingon used it to go back in time. Yeah. At the end of the day, nothing changed. Just they were in that timeline. Yeah. Or I think the prophets really just wanted to rescue Tribbles because the Klingons had killed them all. But that's a different story. But too, if you look at that episode with the other emissary, they sent that guy back to his original timeline. Yes. But somehow it didn't change anything. I mean, we talked about that. That was sort of a hand wave. But maybe that somehow is what the prophets are able to do. Again, you can oh. put a lot of stock into the prophets' abilities yeah. because they're not normal beings. Yeah. So maybe when he went back in time, he actually became a hermit on the top of a mountain just writing his poetry. So his actual impact on the rest of Bajor was minimal. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know. It would raise an interesting question if the prophets have such an ability to see all the possible timelines and modify the timelines that they could make tiny tweaks and preserve what happens, even if they alter something big in the past. Well, because clearly people know that this exists. Yeah. So wouldn't aliens from other places just be destroying Bajor to try to get a hold of this? You would think. Or the Dominion, for example. I. Kai Wynn, the ruler of the galaxy. <laughs> I mean, she you could see yeah. someone like her using it for very nefarious purposes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great point. You know, so I think your point holds up very well that the prophets do choose to allow you to use it and it's within their control. You can't do anything that really affects things negatively. Because now just looking down at my notes here, I see that my first point is about why wouldn't all Bajorans just be clamoring to go back and undo the entire occupation Yeah, or do a better job of killing off Cardassians. It just, <laughs> I mean, it just seems too easy. So there had to be something else. Maybe it wasn't as easy as just opening it and then it would send you back to the thing that you wanted. Yeah. Although we had a lot of questions about that in that Tribbles episode, too. How did the Klingon manage to get it to send him right where he wanted to go? Uh, I'm, I'm reverting to my hand-waving problem with this <laughs> migraine trigger. I think because the prophets wanted to maybe teach that Klingon a lesson, or they wanted to save the Tribbles. Yeah. Or they understood that the Cisco really wanted to meet Captain Kirk. Oh, yeah, he wanted, the, he wanted his autograph <laughs> on that pad at the end. That's right, exactly. Here's another idea with that. Okay. Perhaps this is like the movie Scrooged. Remember where the ghost of Christmas past took him to previous Christmases? Yeah. And says to him, this isn't live, it's kind of like a rewrite. Oh, right, yeah. You can't really affect anything. Yes, so maybe what actually happens is, like going back to your idea as well, the woman that Kira was, was actually there, that yeah. there was a person. And Kira thinks she's making choices not to join the resistance or to plant the bomb or to do these other things, but she isn't. Yeah. She's actually living the life of a person who was there. Yeah. So her choices are already being mapped out. Yeah. It's a pre-written part. Yeah. And she thinks she's making these choices, but these are exactly the choices the original person made. But why did the original person save Ducat? Maybe they felt the same thing of, hmm. they felt sorry for their friend. Hmm. Okay. A lot of headcanon there. Yeah, we are really having to headcanon our <laughs> way into this. Next thing, don't you think Cardassian security is pretty lax? Uh, yeah. It actually seems to be worse than Federation security. It's pretty bad, yeah. And I wonder if that comes entirely from them thinking that the Bajorans aren't smart enough to really plan attacks. They don't really have the capacity to do it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. They don't. Yeah put a lot of stock into what the Bajorans are able to do. Much to their detriment. <laughs> yeah. Final thing. Yeah. Do you think the prophets were trying to teach Kira a lesson? That the line between a collaborator and a victim is not so cut and dried as she believed. She just looked at the surface. Her mother was just doing what was necessary to survive and to keep her family alive because they would have killed her family. Yeah. Kira didn't have an appreciation for that side of it. And the prophets were giving her this experience so she could maybe look at it and go, perhaps they didn't have a choice. Although, let's face it, at the end, Kira didn't actually seem that convinced. No. 
Well, she was torn, for sure. Yeah. Well, I have the same question I always have when you ask me, did the prophets do this? And the question is, why? Why would the prophets do this for Kira? Because it's a learning experience for Kira. Mm. Because going into this episode, she had a view. You were a collaborator or you were a freedom fighter. But what difference does that make to the prophets? That's the problem. (laughs) That's what I don't get. Because I think they care ultimately about the Bajorans. And Kira has been involved with the prophets. She's very devout in her belief for the prophets. True. She's close to the emissary. Yes, she's close to the emissary. She's experienced the prophets. Yeah. This is them trying to expand her view of the world. Okay. Although at the end, she didn't seem that convinced. Well, I did feel like... She thought she needed to give it some more thought and, yeah. you know, maybe she needs to meditate on it or maybe she needs to talk to some friends about it or to a Vedic or something yeah. and get some more ideas or some more input about it before she really can decide. There's certainly things like that in our lives where we don't really know how to feel about it until we've had time to consider it. Right. That wraps up my overanalysis. Well, I'll just add one final thing. Seriously, don't look into comfort women. It's really disturbing. I only have one other thing, I guess, to say in my overanalysis, which is, I don't know how to tell you, Ducat, but if you kidnap a woman and emotionally blackmail her into staying with you, you aren't exactly star-crossed lovers. Ah. It's gross. Hang on, I'm making a note of that. Yeah. I mean, I imagine this is one of the reasons why we see Ducat is so obsessed with Kira, because he knew her mother. Though I also frequently wonder, did the writers know that at the beginning, or is this just something they came up with as we got into season five and six, maybe? I I don't know. I wonder if they added that later. Yeah. If we just go to women in the future, I'm pretty confident I don't need to spend a lot of time (laughs) discussing what I didn't like in this episode. Yeah. I mean, they're obviously trying to show something real that did happen. Yes. So it's not the same as when I get annoyed that they have a single female character and they choose to have her be half naked and stupid and whatever. This is slightly different as this is something from history, but you have opportunities to write whatever you want. We didn't have to write this. We could have written something else that would have been less horrific to women, but it's a choice. The thing that really disturbs me, though, is that the soup guy who he's like, oh, these these women are collaborators, black and white. I would question whether or not women would also feel that way. Yeah. That Kira would just automatically, especially after she had seen what it was like, that they were just taken and thrown into this situation under the threat that their families would be thrown into labor camps. So all of those women who were willing to maybe not fight back or who weren't willing to fight back, they are protecting their families. They fail to see them as victims. So yes, it seems really insulting to not see them as the victims that they are. Yeah. And when Kira is still even considering that at the end, it's just like, really? You didn't see anything in that episode that would make you look at it differently? I just, I don't buy it. Yeah. Do you think The idea might be that she's kind of blinded by the hatred of the Cardassians. Maybe. Their feeling about this is almost irrational. Yeah. Because they're suffering so much. Their children are starving. Their people are oppressed by the Cardassians. So they just look at the surface and go, they're being well fed. They seem to live in relative luxury compared to the rest of us. They don't look past that. They're just looking at the surface. Yeah. And this is where I I go to the lesson. Maybe they were trying to teach Kira, maybe spread word to other Bajorans that these women were victims. Yeah. They were not collaborators. Yeah. And I can see that this sort of works in favor of your argument that maybe this is what the prophets were trying to show Kira. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I'll accept that. (laughs) Well, thank you. Okay, I don't think I need to say anything more about that. It's pretty clear. So let's go to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating? My rating on this episode is a thumbs up. It is a great performance from Nana Visitor. The episode itself deals with something horrible from actual human history. So it's not completely far-fetched. And I think it was an episode that worked. I think they actually treated it with uh, some dignity. Again, the performances were great throughout. I liked Odo at the beginning, even though he had just a couple of lines. I yeah. thought Cisco was great at the end. It's an episode I enjoyed, even though it's extremely grim. Yeah. Yeah, it's a grim subject. And really, 
they handled it pretty conservatively. Yes. It could have been a lot worse, and they were pretty mild, I guess, in how they portrayed it. Yeah. I agree the performances were strong, particularly from Nana Visitor, so it's really hard to fault her. Yeah. Though I will say, I struggled even to watch it the second time, right, to finish up the notes. So am I going to watch this episode again? No, thank you. I'm good. But I agree some important things happened and the performances were good. So I will give it just a slight thumbs up. That is good. And it's only slight because I'm never going to watch it again. <laughs> but I understand the point in the story. Yeah. Okay, that wraps up Season 6, Episode 17. Come back next week for Episode 18. In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own over-analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com or tweet us at rebingeit. We're also on Instagram and YouTube at rebingeit. You can check us out on talkthroughmedia.com where you can listen to the other podcasts in our network, and you can also leave feedback there for individual episodes. We are a part of a Patreon, patreon.com slash Star Trek TTM, that benefits all of the podcasts on the network. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it for me. 